So first and foremost, um, I just want to thank everybody for coming. My name is Ron Chinzer. I'm with the Toronto Police Service. I work out of the Gang Prevention Task Force. Just I spoke to most of you myself today. The purpose of speaking to you, if I didn't get a chance to talk to you, sorry. But the purpose was to find out where you're coming from. Kind of what brought you here today. Not why you're here, but what happened or what brought you here today and where we can fill things in together. And that's kind of the theme of this. After my 45 minute spiel, what we end up doing is I take off the microphone, I turn off the cameras, everything goes off. We set up the tables in a round table discussion. And in there, it is an open and honest discussion where you can say what you feel, say what you thought, say your experiences, and understand that I hope everyone in this room is okay with the thoughts and sharing them. That's okay. Might be, might be Canada Revenue Agency. <laughs> Better pick that up. But in that open discussion, uh, what I promise you is we will take your concerns, we will package them in a way that protects you, and we'll make sure it gets to the eyes and ears of the people who need to see it. So I'll give you some of the insights of some of the information that we collected as we go on. And prior to that open discussion, I'll give you exactly some of the examples of things we've taken from those conversations that have helped us tremendously engage communities like yours. That being said, um, every one of these we've done, and this is our seventh one, we've changed from the last one. And the reason we change it from the last one is at the end of this, when we have that open discussion, we're learning things that we could do better and we're learning things to better present information. So know that this is completely different than the first one and our next one will be different than this. And in all of them, we like to change stuff. We like to add things. One of the things we're adding in today because it's come up into a few of our town halls is what exactly is Crime Stoppers? So I'm gonna play you a quick video. It's only three minutes and then we'll move past it. So here's a background as to what Crime Stoppers is. The big takeaway from Crime Stoppers is a lot of people don't know and it's okay. I never even knew before becoming a police officer. They're completely separate than the police. It's civilians, it's a separate company, it's a charity. And what they do is they get information anonymously. You can call, they never ask for your name. They never ask for your phone number. They just want the information. <clears throat> and sometimes if the information is useful for the police and we find things like a person with a gun or a kidnapped child or somebody who's breaking into houses, you can get a cash reward for it. And the police, we never know who did it. So you call Crime Stoppers, Crime Stoppers calls us, we do our thing, we let Crime Stoppers know it was good, everything went well, they contact you or they give you a number for you to contact them back, and then you can get a cash payment. <clears throat> that being said, when you first came in, you got two handouts, right? One of them is a nice colored copy front and back. That's just important stuff to know if you really want a little bit of the background in terms of what's happening with gangs. <clears throat> The most important part about this, or that sheet that you have, sorry, this is going a little fast. The most important part of that sheet you have, while it's all important, is the very back of it. It has my contact information as well as my partner, uh, Detective Condo. It has all our information there. What I ask is after this, if you do have some follow up questions, if you have some currents, you have some ideas, you want to partner with us, you want to volunteer your time, get a hold of myself or Detective Condo. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, there's two of us right now, so sometimes we're inundated. Trust me, we'll get back to you maybe in 2025, but I will call you. <clears throat> that being said, um, has anybody seen this before? The Integrated Gang Prevention Task Force? Has anybody even heard of it? You hear of guns and gangs, right? And we all kind of know what that is. It's, it's the cool, handsome cops like myself when we go out there and we used to break in those doors and get these bad guys, quote unquote bad guys, who now we call them people who make bad decisions. And they have guns and then we arrest them and we say, okay, off you go, we did it. Well, three years ago, our higher ups, one of the higher ups came down to the Guns and Gangs office and he said, listen, we need to take this to another level. And I'll explain this to those of you who might not understand the police lingo, especially when it comes down to ranks and titles, because sometimes it's confusing. Even I get confused. I want you to imagine Walmart. All right, now Walmart, the top, there's a president of Walmart, a CEO. Well, that president for us is the chief of police. And underneath that vice president are four vice, sorry, underneath that CEO of Walmart, are four vice presidents. And those four vice presidents in Toronto Police Service, we call them deputy chiefs. And each four of those control a different part of the Toronto Police Service. Now, in our case, our deputy chief that really started this idea, his name is Deputy Chief Jim Raymer, And he's in charge of what's called the Specialized Operations Command. So our gun and gang task force, our drug squad, our hold up squad, some cool stuff that you see on TV, that kind of stuff, he was kind of in charge of that. And three years ago, after he traveled for a bit, he came back to the gun and gang office. He found my, my boss, Jason Condo, and he said, Jason, I need you to do two things for me. 
One is we have to look beyond arresting gang members. Every year, over 15 years, we arrest gang members and we hold gangs accountable for what they do. And every year, it does nothing for the actual problem. Yeah, we're holding people accountable for the violence that they do and the victimization that they conduct, but then they just get back out and we don't really solve the root problems that are gangs. And the second thing he asked, and he said, I need you to find the best looking person you know and have him come on board and help you. And that's how I got involved in this. So that being said, we thought about it. And three years ago, when Jason and I got together and we said, how are we gonna do this? We touched base with a lot of different police officers and we said, hey, really the idea is, how do we get a gang member out of a gang? How do we do this safely? How do we do this effectively? How do we do it quickly? And the more police officers we spoke to, the more we realized it can't be that simple. Right, if I were to ask you here now in this room, how would you get a gang member out of a gang, what would you say? Nobody really knows. Right, so some people said some stuff like get them a job, you know, teach them different things, um, you know, expose them to a different life. And it sounds great, but how do you actually do that? So with us, we said, all right, we're going to stay away from talking to people who get their advice, which is called conventional wisdom. We're going to go to an academic component, which is we partnered with a university being University of Guelph Humber. We have some students from that university here that partnered with us and helped us out over the last three years. And we said, we want to do intensive research. And what we want to do is we want to look all over the world and see, does any other police force or service in the world have a successful way of doing this? Does any other police force have a gang exit program, something where they get gang members out of gangs. And unfortunately for us, nobody in the world has a successful way to do this. So we said, all right, nobody in the world can do this. We're not smart enough to figure this out. But we did realize two things. One is this problem is much bigger than what you think it is. Gangs are not as simple as saying there's a gang in the corner and that's a problem and that's what we've got to deal with. And the second thing we found was while we can't get a gang member out of gang, we found a lot of different strategies to prevent the kid from the age of zero to 18 to get into a gang in the first place. So our gang strategy went from how do we get a gang member out of gangs to how do we stop kids from the age of zero to 18 from getting in gangs in the first place? And what you have in front of you is you have that little laminated card. Those are called gang risk factors. And those gang risk factors are the same ones up here. And they're split up into five categories, which we'll go over. And ultimately what it comes down to, and this is academically sourced and evidence-based, they looked at PG, PhDs from all over the world, and they agreed that the more of those risk factors you suffer from, so imagine the little box beside each one of those lines, the more of those you check off, the more likely you are to become a gang member all over the world. So perfect, we found a way to identify kids that might be going into this lifestyle. And the second part of it was we had to determine how are we gonna get into communities and how did we end up here? So if I were to ask you here now, actually before we get there, I'll ask you here in your experiences here, if I were to ask you what the purpose is of a gang, oh, I just gave it to you, that's a purpose. But the big question we ask here is generally speaking when I ask people and I said, okay, you tell me, and I spoke to almost all of you and I said, what brought you here today? And everybody gave me a very different answer. Some of the answers had to do with, I'm a community member, I live in the area, I'm concerned. Other ones were, we read stuff on the TV, we, we saw stuff in news, we're a little worried. Other ones were, I deal with children that are gang involved, and I wanna know how I can help, or I wanna learn more. Other things have to do with parents that are concerned for their kids, but everybody has a different reason for coming today. But some of the questions we ask is, well, what is a gang to you? So if I were to ask you now, without looking at this, if I were to ask you, not knowing this, if I were to ask you, what is a gang to you, what would you say prior to this? They violate rules, right? So that's what a gang is. Right? The people who violate rules? Very good. Yes, ma'am. Sense of belonging. A sense of belonging. Right, and what else? Income. Income, right? So you got up there. Now, here's the important thing. Yes, ma'am. Protection. Protection. So some of the answers you gave are reasons people might join games, but they're not the purpose of a gang themselves. So far to break down what the purpose of a gang is, and it's very important for us at the very beginning, when we said, okay, we're gonna target gangs to f somehow create an opportunity for kids in gangs, we have to first know, well, what is a gang? Like, what are we actually looking at? We had one of these in Regent Park, and it was beautiful. If you've ever been down the Regent Park Community Center, it's gorgeous. And they have this massive bay window, and as we're having this conversation, I look out there, and there was 10 kids playing basketball in a neighborhood. Now, Regent Park historically has been known as a troubled area. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Now there's 10 kids playing basketball in a troubled area. Is that a gang? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. But just based on what we know, is that a gang? Is it fair? Is it fair for me to go as a police officer to say, that's a gang? No. 
Not at all. So really we have to look at fairly, what is the scope or what should we be looking for when we're looking at what is the problem? Now gangs, they only exist for three reasons academically. Right, one is to collect debt, one is to control territory, and the third is to deal drugs. They do a lot of other things that support these three, but these are the big three that are consistent in every academic study when they said, what is the core operation of a gang? It's to do these three things. So nice, those kids playing basketball, based on this, are they a gang or are they not a gang? No, let's say those, those 10 kids, a couple of them take off and five stick around and we see them dealing drugs, gang or not a gang? Maybe. Ah, now they're exhibiting some behavior. But the point was we have to be very clear in what we're looking at. And the second question became, well, who joins a gang? So let's do this. I love doing this. And this is, this is going to get very uncomfortable, okay? This is uncomfortable for me too. But I'm asking here everybody be very open-minded. The point of being open-minded here is when we first come in here, and I want you to think of it like this, all right? Because this is sometimes tough for people to get over. When we first came in here and we were setting up, there was a group of kids sitting in that room there, maybe five or six years old, babies. They were drawing, they were coloring, they were behaving themselves. They were super sweet kids. Now I want you to remember that and remember that going forward because our goal is for those kids to live the best life possible. And we can do it, 100% we can do it. We have a solution. I promise you we have a solution, but we can't do it by ourselves. So when you answer questions, as uncomfortable as it is for you, I want you to tell me what you feel and tell me what you think. And that could be based off of your experience, which is 100% true and absolute to you. And I don't want you to think that you're gonna get criticized for it because it's okay, but we all have to agree. So is everybody okay with that? Yeah, everybody's good with being open and honest? Everybody's good with giving me $10 after this? Yeah, <laughs> you nodded your head. Yeah, I got it, 20 bucks. Okay, so I got this, this is the scenario. I got a magic pill, I pull it out of my pocket. This magic pill is amazing. And what this magic pill is gonna do is we're gonna find a kid or person who's involved in a gang right now, and we're gonna give this person this pill, and they're a gang person, right? They're involved in gangs, and we're gonna give them this pill, and when we give them this pill, instantly, their life is gonna change. They're gonna be really driven to go to school. They're gonna be a multimillionaire. They're gonna come back to the community that they grew up in. They're gonna develop businesses. They're gonna develop an economy. They're gonna give back and be a mentor for that community. But we only have one hour to give this kid this pill. So two things we have to look at, all right? Number one is where do we go in the city of Toronto? And number two is what does this kid look like? So we're gonna go with the easy one first. Where do we go in the city of Toronto? I gotta find this gang kid. We got an hour, we got 50 minutes, 60 minutes. Where do we go? Somebody give me a neighborhood. Cataraki. Cataraki, right? So Cataraki, have you had experiences in Cataraki? I live in Cataraki. You live in Cataraki, so you have personal experiences, you know what it is, right? So is everybody, is anybody not okay with Cataraki? Yes, sir. Jane and Finch. Jane and Finch. Okay. So Scarborough. Scarborough is a big city. We're in Scarborough. It's a, it's a big city, right? So we're going to go with, let's go, okay, let's pick one. Malvern. Malvern. Look at, oh, so we have all these areas, which is beautiful. So now we've got to pick it to one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the gentleman in the back, Cataraki. Okay, we're all good with Cataraki. Does everybody say, hey, we've got to give this pill? Now it's 50 minutes. Time is going down. Cataraki, we've got a great spot. Now we need to describe what this kid looks like. I'm going to change his life, and not only his life or her life, but millions of people for generations to come. There's going to be a statue of this kid. Nobody's going to take credit. They're going to have a statue of this kid and say, this kid brought this place back to life. This kid took this pill, and this kid changed millions of lives for thousands of years. And now these areas that were thrown out there, they're no longer associated to gangs. Instead, they're associated to success and winning and developing champions. So, but I have to know what this kid looks like. And now we're down to 40 minutes and I got this pill. So is it a boy or a girl? Boy. It's a boy? Yeah. It could be either, but we got to pick one. Boy. I got 50 minutes. Boy. boy? Perfect. Okay. Well, how old roughly is this boy? 15. 13. 15, 13. So 13 to 15. Are we good with that? Everybody good with that? Uh, what type of hair do they have? Or do they wear a hat? Bandana. And then you said something on hoodies. So hoodie, bandana, is there a color on the bandana or a color on the hoodie? Yeah. Black hoodie, blue bandana. She said it with conviction, right? So black hoodie, blue bandana, 13 to 15 year old kid, cataracty, we get down there. Uh, what about tattoos or jewelry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Now here's the difficult one for you. What color is the skin of this person? Uh uh, racialized. Give me a color. I got 20 minutes. We've got to give this pill. It's going to change the world. Somebody's got to give me a skin Brown. color. Brown. Brown. 
Handsome brown like this, chocolatey brown, or what dark brown, light brown? <laughs> lot of... So now we got this pill, we got 15 minutes, and together as a room, we're gonna change this person's life, and we have the easiest way to do it, it's a pill, it's amazing. Now I end up going into Cataraki. I find a 13 to 15 year old kid wearing a bandana and a black hoodie who's brown, and he's got a hat on or whatever, and I grab him and I force him, and I say, kid, this is gonna change your life, you're a gang member. Can I do that? No. <laughs> Why can't I do that? It's wrong. I don't know if this guy's a gang member just based on how he looks like or where he lives. It's terrible to think like that. So very quickly on, even as law enforcement, we have to be really objective, being get away from our experiences, get away from our feelings, and look at what's actually happening in the community. And that is 100% part of this discussion. And I'll give you a story. When we first started this, our goal was to find kids being under the age of 18. And in our case, when I say kid, I say really under the age of 21. Because I want you to think back when you were 21. For some of you, I want to think back last week, all the horrible decisions that you did. But especially when you were a kid. So we said, all right, what we want to do is we want to take these risk factors that we learned about, that the more of these you have, the more likely you're going to be a gang member. And myself and Jason spent six months, and we spoke to over 2,000 frontline police officers in the streets of Toronto. And we said, guys and girls, if you come across a kid or a family or somebody that you think fits this bill, and they're gang involved, or you think they're gang involved, or they might get in gang involved, and you have a relationship with them, can you throw out the idea that, hey, we can potentially help you? And this was kind of an exploring phase for us, because nobody has a way to do this. And what happened is we get turned on to a kid who's 14 years old. At the time that we get turned on to this kid, and this kid is very motivated to want to escape the gang lifestyle. And I'm gonna tell you the story of this kid in relation to the risk factors that you have. Because these risk factors, while there's 36 of them, they're split up into five categories. And why they got split up into five categories is because each of those categories comes up at a different time in somebody's life. And this kid, along with about 70 others that we've worked with, unfortunately, unsuccessfully over the last three years, fits the bill on the head. So as I'm telling you this story, the interest of a conversation, if any part of this does not make sense to you or you say, Ron, that's totally wrong, by all means, tell me. All right, and interject and say, listen, that's actually wrong, you're incorrect, I can't even understand this, all right? Because it's important for us to know, but I'm gonna tell you the story. So what happens is this kid, he's 14, he gets arrested, a police officer who we had trained and had a quick 15 minute conversation on says, hey, I got the perfect kid for you. I arrested him, but we have a good relationship. He expressed some interest in potentially trying to change his life. So we go and he gets arrested and we talk to him and we have a conversation, we start to tell his life story a little bit. And his life story also included his family because under the age of 18, we always include the families. So we figured something out. And I'm gonna tell you this kid's story. At the age of three is when you have those family risk factor categories, right? And you have those cards in front of you. Now, how many risk factors are in the family category? Take a look, anybody? Family, family, family. We got about nine, eight or nine, right? So these family risk factor categories, they pop up from the age of zero to six. Zero to six, zero to six. And with this kid in particular, the biggest one that comes across in all the studies is that the age of three is delinquent behavior, sorry, poor behavior in the household. I'm not talking about the three-year-old who doesn't know how to pee in the toilet. I'm talking about a three-year-old that punches and hits everybody, you know, takes things they're not supposed to, does naughty things. So with this kid, I'll give you the background for him. He is one of five kids in the city of Toronto. He belongs to a single mother. Now the mother, she's 25 at the time that he's born, and he's the middle kid. So the mom, by the age of 27, 28, had already five kids living in community housing, single mother on her own. And these kids were sharing one bedroom. Now at the age of three, for those of us with small kids and all that stuff, I'll ask you this, anybody who's had kids that are three years old and you got a little one there, be prepared, brother. It gets crazy, but then it gets awesome. So I want you to think about this. You have a three-year-old at home, which is this kid, and he's the middle kid, which seems to be something. And you're washing your dishes, right? So anybody who's had kids and you wash your dishes at home and you can hear the kids playing, everything's okay, right? What happens when you don't hear anything? What do you do? You're washing dishes, you don't hear anything, you know what I do? I shut off the water tap, I kick the door open like a cop, and I go, gotcha. And they're always doing something naughty, right, that they're not supposed to do. Well, that's this kid. So this kid at the age of three realizes when I do naughty things, what happens is mom gives me attention. So very early on, this kid starts to associate, and not on purpose, he's three years old, he doesn't know what's happening. And I'll give you this, psychologically, between the ages of zero to seven, our brains operate on what's called a theta wave. And what a theta wave is, it's a state of hypnosis. And in that state of hypnosis, what we're doing as little kids, as little humans, is we're gathering information from our surroundings in our life. And that information isn't for 
isn't what we're going to use to be successful. It's what information do I need to survive in life? So they're just taking in what do I need to survive? Not what do I need to succeed? What do I need to survive? So this kid at the age of three realizes the naughty things I do, mom comes and gives me attention. She's got five kids. She's exhausted. She has to get up at five in the morning, take her kids to the bus stop. The oldest kid takes care of the rest of them as they go to school. By the time they come back, mom's done her second job and she's got no energy. She's exhausted. So she just kind of lets the kids grow themselves. Now this kid all of a sudden, the age of three, goes up and now we're in the school risk factor category. And I know we have some educators here from the school system, which is fantastic. Now at the age of three, this kid, and I want you to remember, okay, kid does something wrong, gets attention that they want. They get into school. And the biggest indicator at the age of six out of all these risk factors is school failure. All right, now I know we're saying this is Canada, it's next to impossible to fail school, but there's a big difference in passing and succeeding. The educators, am I wrong or am I right? right? There's a big difference in passing kindergarten and succeeding kindergarten. And anybody here, does anybody here think it's okay for a kid to fail kindergarten? Yeah. You think it's okay? Okay, so uh, you, maybe in terms of passing and standards, but it's the same five or six year old kid there. Do we just say to that kid at the age of five or six, you're failing too bad for you? Does anybody feel a responsibility there at any level to can maybe step in and say what's happening? Is it normal for a kindergarten to fail kindergarten? Not at all. So that's the second biggest indicator is there. Now I want you to picture this kid in school. He gets to school, who's a replacement for mom in school? The teacher. So the same kid and his mom tells us when he's in school in kindergarten, he continues to do the same behavior, right? The poor behavior that he does at home at the age of three, he does in school at the age of six. And when he does in school, what do teachers do? They do the best things that they can. Listen, teachers are angels to me. They changed my life. If I didn't have a teacher, I would have been a criminal for sure. But my teachers were amazing to me. So this teacher comes, takes this kid and says, we're going to put you to the side. And we're going to give you special attention and special lessons. And what they've done is they've taken this kid away from the social environment. They put him away. They're trying to figure things out. So now this kid realizes, okay, this works at home. This works at school. And now this kid becomes nine years old. Any nine-year-old kids here? Nine? Ten. Oh, that's a big number. All right, that's double digits. Nine years old, nine years old. Now, I'll ask you this. For those of us here who are a little bit older, you don't have to date yourself. When you were nine years old, were you out playing by yourself? Yo, I was. I was a disaster at nine. All right, the rule in my house was as long as you come home before the streetlights come on, that's it. you got to be home. All right, so we knew after school we would just go run. Uh, do sometimes naughty things, but as long as those street lights run on, by the time I came home, I was okay. Now for me, I have a nine-year-old, and my nine-year-old can't go to the park across the street without me in war paint hiding in the bushes with a sniper rifle. I gotta make sure she's okay. I gotta make sure everything's good. That's just the way I am now, right? Very different. But in the city of Toronto, it is not uncommon to see kids at the age of six, seven, eight, nine out playing by themselves. Is that fair? Has anybody here not seen that? I've seen some young kids at the age of maybe four or five playing by themselves, unfortunately to say, in community housing. Because what does happen? So I'll tell you what happens with this kid in particular. So three, problems at, school, uh, at home. Six, problems at school. Nine, gets to school, starts causing more problems. You know what mom says? You got too much energy. You got to get out of here. Go outside and dump your energy. So now, I love it. This kid goes out and this kid goes into the wild, I call it. Because I've heard it called the wild. And now this kid, nine years old, he's out there on his own for the first time. And does he find more people like him or less like him? More like him. So for the first time, this kid tells us, man, nine years old, I found people just like me. Man, this person, the way they think, the way they receive information, exactly the way I do. Oh, my God, there's another kid over there, the same as me. And next thing you know, we have a group of about seven or eight kids. And something happens with this kid between the age of nine and 15. Something, a lot of things happen with this kid between 9 and 15. I'll give you the, the police history on this kid so you know. And we asked them about it, and it all made sense when we looked at the risk factors and we looked at the studies. So at the age of 8, mom manages to get this kid a bicycle. Or he made his friends already. They all got bikes. He went, Mom, I want a bike, I want a bike. I don't know how she got it. It doesn't matter. She got him a bicycle. He gets it. And he gets his bicycle, and he takes off. And what happens is he's not in the best area. He's, they're kind of exploring. He leaves his bike. It's downtown Toronto. Somebody comes and steal it, and this kid walks home, and he's terrified, right? He's terrified. He even knows at the age of eight or nine, mom is going to kill me. And he opens the door, and he tells mom, he says, mom, somebody stole my bike. And what does mom say? What does mom say? She smacks him. What else does she do? Right? So she tells this kid, you idiot, you had one job. You don't know what I did for this bike. 
I did it for you. You can't even take care of this. This is the problem with you. He's nine. The bike got stolen. He's in a rough part of the neighborhood. He's not rolling with the best people. This bike gets when he comes home and hears that. Well, they report it to the police. And we show up and listen, this is the city of Toronto. There's about 19 billion bicycles here. All right? Unless most of the time we come across your bicycle by accident, the likelihood of us finding your bike is kind of low. It's just the way it goes. So they call the police and we say, we're going to try and we have the report, but we don't find the bicycle. And well, within a year later, same thing happens. Mom manages to get a bike, bike gets stolen. They call the police. We show up, we do our job, but we can't find the bicycle. So two times this kid gets in trouble. Now there's a gap between the ages of nine and 11. There's a big gap. We don't know what happens. And then the next phone call we get from the mom is my kid is missing at the age of 11, hasn't come home. So we go there and we ask the mom and said, well, what happened? I don't know. He's supposed to be home by the streetlights. He's not here. I spent three hours. I'm worried about him. We end up going. We end up kind of finding where he is. And we find him. We find who he's with. So as police officers, we say, okay, you're here in the corner. Great. We're going to take you back home. We take him back home later on that day. And then a couple months later, he gets reported missing again. This time, the police have a record. So we go in and we check the corner where he was before. We find him there. And this time, he's with people. So we do what we do. We want to know, well, who are you with in case you go missing again? We know who to call. So now we found some other people that he hangs around. We take him back home. Now at the age of 13, he goes missing. He doesn't come back for about a week or two. We don't know where this guy goes. And then our next interactions with this guy at the age of 13 and 14 are serious violent offenses. You have extortion, theft, robbery, weapons offenses, some assaults, some drug offenses. And now at the age of 14 or 15, when he had him, he's a full-fledged, an admitted gang member. He tells us, I am a gang member. This is the gang I belong to. He actually lifts up his shirt and he's got the gang name on his shirt. He's not hiding it. He actually shows us on social media, this is me, this is what I am now. So we ask him and we, the natural question for us in this exploring phase was, how did you get in a gang? And he says at the age of 12, when he was missing the second time or third time, he said there was somebody in the neighborhood who had found me and he called him an OG. And an OG, does anybody know what that means? So an OG is an original gangster, is what they call it on the street, or an old gangster. And it's somebody who's been in a gang for a long time that has a lot of respect in the streets. So this 12-year-old, when he's 12, he tells us an OG comes and finds me, and he gets me to do these small things, and then he gives me this T-shirt, and he says, you're part of us now. So this kid says, this is perfect. This is what I am. That's why at the age of 15, he's okay telling us, this is who I am. You know how old the OG was? When this kid was 12, the OG who recruited him into a gang? Guess. 21. 21. 35? What else? Late 20s. Late 20s. Great answers. He was 16. So na- 16. So now we have kids recruiting kids into gangs. We have a cycle here. We have an absolute cycle. Now I'll tell you what this kid, at the age of 15, we had lost him. And I don't mean he died. What I mean is we have no more influence on this kid. He doesn't want to participate in any phone conversations. He doesn't want to meet with us. He doesn't want to talk to us. And we have a way of doing it where it's all confidential. We, we do it with the family. With the interest for us is how do we get this kid out of that lifestyle? How do we get this kid on a path of success as quick as possible without ever having to arrest him anymore? That's the goal for us. Well, we lose this kid. We decide. So let's go back and talk to the mom and figure things out. And what happens is we go home. We knock on the mom's door. She answers. We say, where is this guy? She goes, I don't know. I haven't seen him in a couple of days. So we decide to check the risk factors for this mom. And we have this sheet that we fill out. And we give it to the mom and say, hey, whatever you think applies to you, hit it. And the mom had more risk factors from the kid. Okay, the kid had, let's say out of the 36, the kid had 25 or 26. The mom had 30. So then the natural thought became, ah, oh, man, what happened from the mom to the kid where the mom has more risk factors than the actual kid? And then it dawned on us in many conversations with psychologists and many other experts in their fields. I want you to think of this. Um, who here is an immigrant to this country? Right, you landed. Now, immigrant to this country, right? And where are you from, sir? Uh, London, England. London, England. Beautiful London, England. Yourself in the back, ma'am? Yes. Bangladesh. Bangladesh. And then yourself, who else put their hand up here? You put your hand up. Yes, sir? India. India. Yeah, we did it. India. Sorry. <laughs> yes, and you, you said Bangladesh. Bangladesh, yourself? Ukraine. Ukraine. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. Bangladesh. India. India. Iran. Iran. India. India. Right. Now, I want you to think of this, all right? My parents immigrated here from India, and uh, when they came, right, it was, it was a different time. My dad went through a lot of racism. We went through a lot of racism as kids and all that good stuff, which is whatever. But I remember one day I came into the office, and I don't know where my boss is, where he's Jason Kondo, he's here. I'm going to 
give him a hard time. One day I come into the office and I got Jason a coffee. Okay, a coffee, basic coffee like this. And accidentally, there was cream in it instead of milk. And he goes, man, my day is ruined. And guess what? My, <laughs> my day would have been ruined too. And I thought to myself, man, like, you know, th this stupid coffee would ruin my day. And then I would think, man, I got a hard life. I would drive home to my nice house. Ah, oh, traffic sucks, I had a hard life. And then when we had this experience with the mom, I thought about my parents. And I go, no, no, that was a hard life. Okay, so I have nothing to complain about. But then I looked past that and I said, well, what about my kids? You know what I say to my kids? You're spoiled. Because the stuff I'm doing for you, as much as I was spoiled by my kids, you guys are spoiled at a different level. But the point of that is it's supposed to get easier. That's the point of this, it's, it's supposed to get easier. When you came to this country, did you come here to make a harder life for you or easier life? Definitely easier. The beginning is harder life. It's yeah. It's hard when you come here, but why did you come here? For your kids. Yes. To give them a better life. So your life was hard and your parents' life was hard, but these guys are going to have an easier life. And then one day you're going to have kids and it's, they're going to say, my life was hard. That's the point of this. So with the mom, the point was she did the absolute best that she could to give this kid the absolute best life that she could. But unfortunately, in this case, the absolute best life was still gang membership. And then we get to the state that we're at now. And this is the community risk factors. And this is where you see it in the news now. You see it in the newspapers. You see it all over. We have a federal election, and all three or four of the leaders from all the different parties come out there. And what are they talking about right now? Guns, guns gangs. What are we going to do about this? Right? That's what they're talking about because it's the topic to talk about. Guns and gangs. And now we have federal leaders talking about it. And these are the strategies that we're going to do. And the reason that's out there is now when this kid, when he's 15, when we had dealt with him, now he's probably 16 or 17, when he hits 18, this is where we see the daytime shootings. This is when you see the drive-bys. This is when you see shootings happening in areas that most people are saying shootings should not happen here, which is a whole other issue. And what happens is the community stands up, and what does the community say? Somebody has to do something about this. And who's the somebody that has to do something about this? It's the police. And you know what we feel? 100% we have to do something about this, but now we have an insane amount of pressure that we put on ourselves to say, how do we deal with this? And this is kind of where we came from. But I'll ask you this, and the point of knowing those risk factors are, there's five categories and 36 risk factors. And I get called all the time, all right? I get called from all over Canada, and now I'm getting called from the States, and they say to me, what is the program that you have to stop gang members from getting into gangs, and how do you get guys out of gangs? They say, what is the program? And you know what I tell them? There is no program. Because if I were to have a single solution for this many problems, I promise you I'd be living in the Barbados somewhere on a yacht because I would sell this idea to everybody. But we don't. But what we do have is we have lots of smaller solutions that we need to implement from the age of zero all the way up to 18 when we identify these things. And I'll tell you the importance of that. We'll look at those risk factors. We'll just use the five of them, all right? The five categories. Family, school, peer group, individual, and community. Five of them. Anybody here good at math? Any accountants here? No? No, okay, I'd use calculator, so I'll tell you this. So if I were to give you five different colored balls, black, blue, yellow, brown, orange, and I said, I want you to make as many different combinations of these balls as you can, how many do you think I could make? Five risk factors, five different colored balls, and I say, we gotta mix this up. You gotta give me the number of combinations we can make. How many do you think we can make? I'll tell you, 3,125. So if I were to come here and tell you we have a solution to 3,125 different combinations of problems, I'd be rich, all right? I'd be super rich, but I'm not, and I'm not in this for the money, and none of us are in this for the money. Now, we're gonna expand that a little further. Let's look at the 36 risk factors. Do you know how many different combinations of 36 we can make? I'm not even gonna ask you the question, I'll tell you the answer. It's 150 unvigatillion, and I'm 99% sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it's the number 150 and 69 zeros after it. 69 zeros. But I get called all the time and they said, Ron, what's the program look like? So there is no program to solve this many problems. But here's where the solution lies. We found a model in the United States. It's called the Comprehensive Gang Model. If you go to our website at torontogangprevention.ca, it's on the sheet I gave you. I have the model listed there. It's 128 pages. Anybody can read it. And this model was based off of a doctor named Irving Spurgle in the United States who was an American gang expert. And he was a gang expert because not only did he look at crime when it came down to gangs from a social perspective, but he looked at it from every perspective. What he wanted to say was, how do we solve this issue the most effectively? And we took that model, we adjusted it very slightly to work in Toronto, and now we're in the growth stage of that model. And that model comes down to this. It's a Rubik's Cube. Is everybody familiar with what that is? 
Yeah, so it's a Rubik's Cube, right? So for those of you who might not know about it, the younger ones, do you know what that is? Yeah, there's no app for it yet, right, I think. so. Um, but this is what it is. This is what a Rubik's Cube is. You get this square, right? There's six different sides. There's nine cubes on each of the sides. And the goal of this is generally when you get it, it's not the same. You have to mix and move everything. When you mix and move, sometimes you get one color, sometimes you don't. But you got to work at it until all of the colors line up perfectly like this one does. Now, I want you to think of this as gangs. Okay, We're going to say this is a gang problem. Now, with us, what we do is police officers and law enforcement as the Toronto Police what we've been doing traditionally is we have that Rubik's Cube, but all we're looking at is the blue side. So what we do is we shuffle and we adjust, we shuffle and we adjust, and when the blue side is made, you know what we say? We solve the Rubik's Cube. What we don't see is the rest of the Rubik's Cube is not solved. Actually, it's in a bit of a mess. And on the other side of the Rubik's Cube, you have Toronto Community Housing, who looks at it and says, well, we need to fix our side, and our side has to be orange. And when they get orange, they say, we solved it. And then you have schools who do the same thing. And then you have jails who do the same thing. You have courts who do the same thing. And what we found was there are about 20 to 30 different government organizations that are all doing the same thing, but we're screwing each other up in the process because we're not talking to each other. So for us, our goal is to find who these stakeholders are, who are the people impacted by this, and how do we get it so that from the age of zero all the way through, in this kid's life, all the people that I come across, we can all recognize what we're looking at and we can know where to go for help for free, and there's tons of them. What I can tell you is these are the people that they recommend you go and find. It's all about partnerships, very high level. And it's simple. Schools, local service providers, law enforcement, a whole bunch of other things. You can look at this. Does this not make sense to anybody? And we're missing a whole bunch, by the way. Because as we've done this, we've come across other partner organizations to say, well, you guys should also come on board, but we should have a conversation for what is this going to look like going forward. And I'll tell you, we've taken this to such a different level because while I might be a Bollywood actor when I'm not here, I don't have a business brain. And this requires a business brain to learn how to implement. I want you to think about this. Uh, anybody who has big family parties, right? Yeah, big family parties. If you were to tell each one of those family members to bring a separate food dish, how many arguments would you have for two people not bringing the same dish? Right? Let's say uh, for the Indians, I'll say roti, right? Let's say somebody makes really good roti. It's like a nice little patty. And you have two different aunts who say, we make the best roti. Now we've got to deal with this. All I'm trying to do is get everybody to bring something different, but they want to fight over it. We're not fighting here, we're just figuring out how we're doing this. So that's difficult to do. Well, on this level, we really are figuring out how to do this the most effectively, so much so that last month, Suman was one of the guys. Uh, lucky for us, we have a lot of people who want to volunteer and help out. A lot of people who want to volunteer and help out. So over the course of a few years, uh, I've developed a, a massive network outside of the police service from businesses and organizations and individuals and groups that have been impacted by gangs that say, we want to help. So they'd reach out to me and they said, hey, any way we can help, we had CEOs of companies, consultants, strategic advisors, people with crazy education said, what can we do to help? And at the time, I didn't know. Well, we talked about it one day when we realized we need some help here. On September 28th, we invited 10 of them to come in. So we had 10 high-level advisors and business specialists, and we said, this is the problem. What do you think the solution is? And they gave us great advice. So we had thousands of dollars worth of, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of consultants that offered their time for free to help us get this going forward. And we're gonna have some more follow-up meetings because they helped us do this quicker. Some of the people we have been in conversation with are these groups right here. It's simple, right? Obviously us, it's the city of Toronto. We have some representation here in the back city of Toronto. Ministry of Attorney General, which is the court system. So when gang members get arrested, what happens with them in courts? Children and the youth services, which is what do we do with kids once they're in there? Correctional services, which is the part when they're in a jail, actually what, what's happening in jail. And as we go across the board, you have schools, CAMH, which is the mental health component, which is a massive component for this, and the list goes on. But there's another reason to do this, and I want you to think about this. And there's, there's so many things we could do, but I really want to get to the end point of this. And what this comes down to for us and us kind of getting into these communities, and I'll tell you how we picked this neighborhood to come into play, right? Because one, we use the risk factors to identify who do we really want to target, but two is what areas do we get into? Now, are you familiar with the city of Toronto being broken up into 140 neighborhoods, right? So where that came from was a couple of years ago, the city of Toronto did a massive audit on the city and they broke that neighborhoods into what's called an equitable score. And what they said is, and it was based off of five different things, but they wanted to say, you know, where are the areas that need the most help in improving? So now they call them neighborhood improvement areas. We have 31 of them. And if you look at the equitable score and kind of how these places occur or happen is, there's a few things. Uh, the ones I can remember off the top of my head is they looked at the communities and they wanted to know what communities didn't really have a voice when it came down to the development of their neighborhood. 
That was one of the indicators. The other one is, what is the average median income of a home? What does the family structure look like at the house? And they divvied it up and they found these 31 low neighborhood areas, right, or low equitable areas. The good news is in 2020, they're dumping in millions of dollars worth of resources and programming and special things for each of the neighborhoods to get them back up to part of where they should be, which is fantastic. Now, if you take a look at those 31 low equitable neighborhoods and we were to take a look at gang crime and I would have two maps and I put them on top of each other, it's almost the same. So now we had a perfect place to come in, right? The city of Toronto is already going to invest into here. This is a great chance for us to come in with the city of Toronto, do some education piece and learn a lot. And really this is education for us. But the other big portion of this is what we wanted to do and things don't always work out the way you want to do is when we planned these town halls a year ago, our goal was to have representation of community partners, organizations and leaders here. And the goal was to have those people here so that we could connect you with services that you need for free from your neighborhood. If we identify the risk factors that you might need help with, or your kids might need help with, you need to come to us. You can go right to them directly. That's the goal is to connect you people with the community services that you have offered to you. That's been a bit of a difficult task. So really, I'll tell you this when it comes down to gangs and gang crime, right? What, what kind of crimes do gangs do? Because whenever we talk about gangs, people just think it's gangs. But what are the crimes that gangs do? Theft. Theft. What else? Break and enter. Break and enter. Yes. What else? You said drugs. Yeah. And what else? Sorry? They, they have jewelry. Yeah, they take your jewelry, they do robberies. Sex, sex trafficking. They have sex trafficking or human trafficking. That's a big one. Guns. guns? What happens with guns? Shootings. shootings. And what happens with a really bad shooting? Murder. So when we had to look at this and we said, okay, we want to do this, we want to do this on a very big scale, it sounds like it costs a lot of money, but in fact it doesn't. It'll actually save a lot of money. This is how much crime actually costs. Okay, this is what it costs. Every murder costs the Canadian taxpayer between five to six million dollars. And these numbers are a super conservative number. I could have brought the really high ones, but I decided to go with the lowest ones on purpose because that's the point. I wanted to say, hey, at the very least, if we prevent one murder, we save five million dollars. Now I'll ask you here, now knowing kind of what you know now, what could we do with that five million dollars that we save? You could do a lot. And the point of this, and I want you to remember this when we talk about this discussion, is when we really engage the communities and we have this open discussion afterwards, we found absolutely amazing people that nobody knew about. In one case, there was an elder Somali male. He was, he was probably a little bit older, maybe 50 or 60. And what he had told us was he mentors 120 kids, and seven of those have graduated from university. And you know how he did it? On his own. And now he's in a state where he can't afford space to be able to mentor these kids. He's not aware of grants, he's not aware of partnerships, he's not aware of funding, but we're managing to connect that guy with it. Now I wanna ask you, if this, kid, if this guy did this to 120 kids that he mentors and in a community very impacted by gang violence with nothing, imagine what he could do with something. We found another ex-gang member who now got out of the gang life and he has these programs where he has about 80 gang kids that he works with, that he mentors to say, get out of the gang life. And he does it with nothing. So we found all these community champions, these community leaders, these people with big ideas in your own community that just needed a little support. And the support doesn't always have to be money. Sometimes it has to be connection. Sometimes it has to be mentoring and networking and all of the good stuff. So our idea is when we have this open conversation, I want you to keep in mind of being open and honest and let's find the answers to some of these solutions. Uh, to close off, I'll tell you what we changed in Toronto for this, is we have four pillars for us, all right? So our gang prevention model, it's not just stopping kids from the age of zero to 18 from getting into gangs. It's not just finding gang members now that want to get out and help them to get out. But we have four pillars. And the first pillar for us and the most important is education. It's taking what we've learned and sharing it and at the same time, receiving some education back. Every one of these open discussions we've had, we've walked away with at least five or six things that we never knew before that are real and true to you, that we need to know because it helps us change our operations going forward to be really effective with this. So education is very important to us. The second part is prevention. It's that whole piece, right, of saying, how do we stop kids from getting into gangs, which we've talked about. The third component is intervention. And I want you to think of this, when you go to the doctor and you're young, healthy, they say we gotta prevent disease, right? To prevent diabetes, you gotta do this. To prevent cancer, you gotta do this. And there's all this research that goes into there. Well, what about all the people who have diabetes? What about all the people who have cancer? Right now, we have tens of thousands of gang members in the criminal justice system that we can't ignore. So while it says gang prevention, for us as law enforcement, 
it's also the intervention. What do we do about the people that are constantly coming in and out? To give you a statistic, a gang member or somebody who self-identifies as a gang member is 70% more likely to reoffend than anybody else. So just by being part of a gang, you're going to be re reincarcerated, you're going to be reoffended. So we have to focus on that. Now with us, the last portion of it is suppression. And what suppression is, and I, we make this very clear, is our role as police is to build this, but to find a different champion for it. We're the best suited to start this conversation out of all those partner groups, but there's probably another organization better suited to maintain and handle this for many reasons. One of them being trust. If I were to get into these neighborhoods and try to develop trust, you might trust me, but you don't trust somebody else. So it's very trust, it's hard to trust an entire organization. Well, there's organizations that already have trust in these communities. So in the efforts of getting rollout strategies really quick, we just want a community service or an agency that already has trust to take the lead for this, and it's finding who that is. But for us, and where the Toronto police lie, is suppression. The number one way to combat gang violence all over the world is arresting gang members who do that violence. We still have to keep in mind that we need to find who's committing that violence. Now, it's not everybody. It's not everybody. And I'll tell you this, there was a study done of a gang in Los Angeles, 300 gang members. And when they looked at the gang, they realized that only 10% of the gang was responsible for almost 100% of the crime. The other 90% have an average gang membership of two to three years. And when they left, they left on their own. So our goal is on the prevention and getting those people out. That 90% that are gonna leave anyways, how can we speed that up? And in the process of finding that 90%, what we've done is we've narrowed our vision as to who should we be looking at in this gang world, right? So we're looking at the 10%. And for us, by focusing on the 10%, who are the 16-year-olds recruiting kids, who are the 20-year-olds uh, participating in human trafficking and committing murders, that's who we need to get a hold of. And we need to make sure we get them held accountable for what they do out of the respect for the victims and the criminal justice system. And once we have them incarcerated, then we work on the intervention end. Then it's like, what can we do to get you out of this? What can we do to fix you? But first, we have to get them in custody. I'll close off with this. This is a quick 60 second clip that we have. It's on our website. You can go there and check it out. I have a how to guide. And if you recognize any of these, and you said, I want to do something, but I don't want to call the police. I don't want to call the city of Toronto. I don't want to call anybody else. I want to do this on my own. You can absolutely do it, and this video will teach you how. Sorry, Jay, can you get that light for me, please? So a lot of people don't realize that there's hundreds of programs available in the city of Toronto. They don't know how to find them. If you go to our website, it'll show you how to find them. We actually put the links on there. There's three different uh, mapping options that we have. Toronto Police Service has uh, a portal. We did it with Ryerson University. Wellbeing Toronto is hosted by the City of Toronto, and then there's Ontario 211. Uh, if you got to pick one, I would say go with Ontario 211, then Toronto Police, because they're the most accurate and up to date. When you click it, you can find it, you can connect with it. Um, that being said, let's take a five minute break. If you guys don't mind, we can put the chairs in a circle, and in that conversation, I'm going to take off the mic, we're going to shut off the cameras, we're going to have an open, honest discussion, and I promise you in there, I'll protect you. If you feel like you got to say something that might put you in a bit of a different position, we can work with it. All right, guys, so grab some timbits, grab some coffee, come back in five minutes, we can set this up in a circle. Thank you.